from the beginning of the book of Mark, the reader knows exactly who Jesus is, the Messiah. Who wrote the book of Mark? It would be interesting to just see the different gospels are, diff- are written by different, either they were disciples, direct disciples of Jesus Christ, or had walked with the apostles. And so in the book of Acts chapter 12 and verse 12, we're introduced to this gentleman called John Mark. He was interested uh, in the gospel. We see a missionary who set out with great men of faith. From the beginning, the story of Mark is a story of, 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 of second chances. Unless we possess the love of God in our hearts, it is impossible to give second chances. Think about it. If God did not give you another chance and another chance and another chance, would heaven be a possibility? One, when we are dealing with young people, let's give them a compelling picture of what's possible, of what God is calling them to be, of what they can become in Christ. Mm-hmm. Of John Mark in his initial days, experiences, um, seems to experience way more challenge and not enough support. And the end result is he gives up. He, he snaps and goes back. Book of Mark shows that where is Jesus heading? He begins from the baptism being prepared for his death. Mm. And in all of this, he begins realizing that God is love in action. He is answers in a person. And what a, what a nice way of mm. beginning this uh, book, Mark, to read so that we know we are actually now on, th- this is our Lord and this is now the way that he is going to follow. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from wherever you're joining us from and a happy Sabbath. What a good God we serve that we are here again for another week, safely through another week, my panelists. What a God we serve. This morning, I am joined uh, by a panelist uh, that we had the last time, and it's good to be able to work together for purposes of continuity. I hope you had a good week. Last week, we were introduced to the book of Mark, and we saw different facets of that book. This week, we are looking at a day in the ministry of Jesus Christ. It will be interesting to see what was Jesus doing in a day of ministry when we look at Jesus. And so this morning, before we begin and before my panelists introduce themselves, I will ask our brother Zef to pray for us. Then we'll go into introductions. We come before you this morning. We thank you so much for the week that was. And now as we want to delve into your word, we pray that you may open our eyes, open our ears and our hearts, that Lord Jehovah, you may speak directly to us and change us to the way you want us to be. Be with each and every one of us, even here, the panelists, uh, the panel, oh God, that we may um, speak only from you. This I pray, believing and trusting in the name of Jesus. Amen. Shall we begin with you by introducing yourself, Zef? Uh, my name is uh, Zef Adar. I'm happy to be here. Amen. Yeah. Seraphine. Happy Sabbath. My name is Seraphine Okemwa. Also happy to be here. Amen. My name is Ansongo Rafael Nyamiswa. It's a wonderful pleasure to be here. And online we have... Saya Jackson. Total pleasure to be here. Amen. Thank you, everybody. And I hope you all had a good week. And it would be nice to hear if there are any blessings and and, and testimonies that you would have for us this morning as we look at a day in the ministry of Jesus Christ. And I like how the the, the lesson writer begins this lesson this week from our memory verse of Mark chapter 1, verse 17, my dear viewer, is that then Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Each gospel, we're told, introduces the the beginning of Jesus' ministry in a particular way. Matthew presents Jesus as calling disciples and then preaching the sermon on the mount. Luke tells us the story of Jesus' inaugural sermon on the Sabbath in a synagogue in Nazareth. John recounts the calling of some of the early disciples at the wedding in Cana, and where Jesus performed his first miracle. The Gospel of of Paul recounts the calling of four disciples and describes a Sabbath in Capernaum (laughs) and what followed. This Sabbath with Jesus at the beginning of Mark gives the reader a sense of who Jesus is. And in the entire section of this week's lesson, there are few of his words recorded, a brief call to discipleship and a command to a demon a plan to visit other locations in the healing of the leper with instruction to show himself to the priest and to be clean. The emphasis, as last week uh, we remember our brother Jackson said, is on action. 
Particularly healing people, the gospel writer uses the word immediate to illustrate the fast action movement of the, mystery, the ministry of Jesus. I like Mark. We said Mark is a guy of action. He's, he's not one of wasting time on words and flowery words. He's your kind of person. I think he's a red personality if I was asked. The kind of guy who says, let us go. And then only, you know, as we are going, we are doing. So he's a person of action. And so shall we see in this we look at a day, so it will, we're going to look at different days and what Jesus was doing by looking at the book of Mark. So we are, we are starting with Mark chapter 1 from verse 16. And I'll go to you, Ralph, to say, when, Jesus t- when, when he said, follow me, who were the men that Jesus was calling as disciples and what was their response? Indeed, uh, interesting uh, looking at uh, the book of Mark. See, Mark sort of um, declutters. Mark delivers to you the skeleton mm. of the gospel. He, he removes all the flesh, all the all of that. He just gives you the skeleton of the, of the gospel, and so you have you have Jesus at his core, mm-hmm. and him and the things that he is doing for his people and for our salvation. And so, in the book of Mark, chapter one and verse sixteen to twenty, we he chronicles the first account of Christ approaching uh, James and John and Peter, uh, as well as Andrew, and. Um, one thing that is interesting is that unlike in Luke chapter 5, verse 1 to 11, and, in, um, and also later on in John chapter 1, verse 29 to 42, as we said, Mark simply leaves out some certain details. For example, John introduces and tells us that these disciples were actually the disciples of John the Baptist. Mm-hmm. And then the Baptist points them to Christ and tells them, Behold the Lamb of God. And then they stop, they stop following the Baptist and they follow Christ. But you see, when, when, when Mark is telling us this story, it simply says that Christ moved, first of all, to, to James and John. Mm-hmm. And he calls them and tells them, Do what? Follow me. Later on, he moves then now to uh, Peter and Andrew. And, um, and, and it seems as if James and John didn't have a, a, a boat per se. Mm-hmm. And so there's, there's that contrast. And so, so the lesson writer says, but the gospel of Mark may be presenting a contrast between the two sets of brothers mm-hmm. in order to illustrate that, that difference, that Jesus calls to discipleship both those that have less resources mm-hmm. and those that have what? Those that have more. It tells us, you see, in, 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 in this account, it t- Luke indicates that Peter does have a boat mm-hmm. and that, in fact, James and John were partners uh, of Peter and Andrew. But in, in this particular uh, account, it seems as if one group, of, one, one set of these uh, tools, uh, one set has a boat and the other doesn't have a boat. Mm-hmm. But in essence, I think the message that um, the lesson writer uh, attributes to this, uh, to a certain extent, is that Christ calls both of those of us with boats mm. and those who don't have boats. Amen. To all uh, who have resources and those who mm. have uh, sources, uh, then to all the call is to do what? To follow him. The, way, the call is to follow him. Mm-hmm. And then the question is then, what was the response of these men? Um, and the Bible records and says that they did what? They left everything. Mm-hmm. They dropped their nets. And they did what? And they followed him. And so the question is, uh, they met Jesus and spent time with him near the river Jordan. Mm-hmm. Consequently, the acceptance of Jesus' call to ministry was not some, uh, some luck or escapade. They had thought this through. Of course, as we, if you read, as, as we've made references to John chapter 1 and verse 29. But then the question is, uh, why does Mark not fill in more details, as you said? Mm. It is, in essence, to emphasize the power of Jesus. He calls unwilling fishermen answer, mm. and their lives and the world itself are never the same. Amen. It simply speaks to us of a God who is beyond our circumstances. You don't really need to explain yourself to him. Mm. What you need to be sure of is, has he called you? And if he has called you, then he is powerful and he is able to sustain you. And if you indeed hearken to the call, follow me, then your life will never be the same again, as was evident in the lives of these fishermen. Amen, amen, amen. Zef, is there anything that the Lord has ever called you to give up and follow Jesus? Yes, um, um, a lot, a lot. Um, I think as a young man, uh, so many things you need to forgo. For example, for me, I really liked football when Mm. I was young. And then I noticed that football was being played every Sabbath, mm-hmm. and this was really messing me up. And because now I couldn't go for the football and again be at peace with myself, so I had to forgo that talent mm. and just follow Jesus. Yeah. Follow Jesus. Follow yeah. Jesus. And even as as I like I like the fact that we have said, and and this is to you, Seraphine, um, as as 
we, we looked at the characteristics of this, this men that God is calling. He, Jesus is calling, and I like what Rafa has said about men with means and those sometimes with not. And sometimes, you know, there's a tendency as a church or, or within the Christian community to think that those who with material things are referred to as blessed. Is it true that you're blessed because you've got material things that you can show so we can see your car, we can see your house? Does that make you blessed? Does that make you a favorite of God or not? And our brothers, somebody who may not have the same amount of things, are they not blessed and is in the Lord calling all of us? I think God is calling each and every one of us regardless of where we are mm -hmm. and what we have or what we do not have. Amen. And I think the greatest asset God seeks, as he is calling people, is a willing heart. Amen. Regardless of the limitations of an individual physically, mm. socially, uh, financially, mm. and even sometimes even mentally, mm. God literally looks for this one great asset. A willing heart. Amen. I love that. And you talked about mentally, and that brings us to our next, uh, our next lesson, Zef, which is talking about an, an unforgettable worship. Because in worship, when we come here, when we come into new life, the desire of our hearts is to come and encounter God. It's normally about holiness. You know, we're looking at our holy presence. Yes. In this particular worship, there's, there's a time when in Jesus, and I keep, I will struggle with this word, Kapanaum. In the synagogue, when he, enter, he encounters an interesting group and an interesting man among those who had come to witness this worship. Can you talk to us about this in Mark 1, 21 to 28? Thank you so much, uh, Mercy. I, I, th this account is really interesting. In fact, if I'm just taking myself into that time, that day, walking with Jesus, and I see Jesus walking, and now he, dis he, he gets into the, uh, uh, the synagogue, is at Kapanam and now he gets into the synagogue and then he started he starts teaching mm -hmm. and while he's teaching you know these people are wondering this this guy is teaching with a lot of authority mm -hmm. and 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 is uh, is 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 very impactful to them and then um, and they do not know him the funny thing is that they do not know him you know when we come here to church you know we know how someone uh, we know particular preachers and how they preach and what to expect but these people are seeing a completely new person and is teaching with authority. Mm -hmm. And while he's teaching, um, in the crowd, there, there, there is someone who was possessed by a demon. Mm. This is also to show us that really people carry a lot of burdens to church. So let's reduce on judging people. Mm. We, we'll just give them time, you know. And while he's preaching, these demons could not stay silent. Mm. You know, these demons could not stay silent. They shouted, you leave us, you know, leave us alone. Mm. It's like Jesus was poking them. Mm. You know, you leave us alone. And, 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 and they said something interesting, which also should be a lesson to us. That is from verse, um, I'll read from verse 24 mm -hmm. of Mark chapter 1. Mm -hmm. It says, saying, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Mm -hmm. Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are. Guess what? Mm -hmm. The Holy One of God. Amen. These demons are mm -hmm. calling Jesus the Holy One of God. The demons recognize Jesus, Jesus at that time. And this, this is to show mm -hmm. that um, Jesus really had, was preaching with power and with love that the demons had just to recognize that this must be someone from somewhere else. And, 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 and um, going on, Jesus tells them to be quiet, you know, be quiet and come out of him. So it's like Jesus is trying to conceal something, mm -hmm. to conceal his identity. Right there and then, the, de the, de the demons had recognized Jesus, but he's telling them to be silent so that this ministry can go on um, not uh, affected. As, as you read on, you'll realize that even after they had known who he was, it was very difficult for him even to go to other cities because now it's like people are very expectant of him mm -hmm. to see him and, and they thronged places so that they can, um, uh, it would be very difficult for mm -hmm. him to get into. And this probably will, would affect his, mini uh, his ministry a little bit because now he could not reach to some of those who he, are, he would have reached to if, if they did not know him. Mm -hmm. And so um, the scholars call this a messianic secret. Mm -hmm. He really wanted not to be known at that time. And um, uh, uh, as we read on, we realize that it was very difficult for people not to know him mm -hmm. because um, 
the, from the works that he did, from what he was teaching them, the influence was very strong to mm -hmm. the people. And, and this spread out very fast and he, he became a very known person very mm -hmm. quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, there's some things probably we might be doing now that might be affecting the ministry in one way or another. Like, let's say, just talking about um, uh, 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 maybe introducing Jesus too early to some people mm. so that they, are, uh, they, they, they already are very judgmental about mm. what you want to say. You know, sometimes when you go out for ministry and you tell someone, you know, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, mm -hmm. they already shut off. They, they can even, they just start relating you with Jehovah Witness and mm. these other people. And could be we are doing some of these things and from here we can learn that sometimes we may need to be very uh, wise as mm -hmm. serpent as we are told mm -hmm. so that we are able to move um we, we are able to be much effective with mm -hmm. our with us spreading the gospel yeah very true and i like that because as a personal testimony, I wasn't always an Adventist, and the first time I encountered Adventism was in, in college. So I walk into college, and my first Sabbath, my first Sabbath, the, the pastor who was preaching that day, my first encounter was when he talked about the mark of the beast and referenced it to Sunday worship. And you should have seen me sitting in that, uh, in that auditorium completely lost and I was a Christian I did love Jesus I loved Jesus with all my heart and there I was and, and and with every word that opened from his mouth he confused me even the more and I was so determined because I remember I left church and went and wrote a letter to my dad and I said I have no idea who these people are but I do not want to be part of them because they do not know God well the Lord is good here I am raising a generation in the faith because there was someone wiser. I don't blame the pastor because that was his someone of the day, but along the way I met people who knew how to deal with me with a gentleness, starting from the known to the unknown to help me understand the faith. So, and, I, and, and, I, and I'll come to you, Sire, in, in seeking to witness to others, why, why might it be prudent for us not to present everything that we believe? Why would it be uh, prudent for us to sometimes um, maybe start from the known to the unknown. Because the, the reason, I'll, I'll use two, two metaphors. One is eating, um, mm. Mm. and the other one is um, growth. Um, I, I did botany, so let me use both to try and explain. Mm -hmm. When you're feeding, if you're feeding a child, okay, you only proceed as fast as the child's appetite and rate of consumption goes. If you try to um, violate any of that, you either run the risk of disinteresting the child in the food mm -hmm. or choking them. So same thing with the truth. It's not the rate at which you push down things that leads to conversion, mm -hmm. but it is the rate at which it is understandable consumable and applicable in the individual's life that will then win them over to keep wanting more. Mm -hmm. So people have different levels of understanding. Their backgrounds are different. Their um, perspectives are different. Mm -hmm. And therefore rushing to force feed them on all the truth just because it is present truth, um, go is, it's counterintuitive. You end up um, either leading them to what is called programmed non-responsiveness mm. or just switching them off from the word. Now, that does not mean we need to shy away from certain topics. It just means the order and the sequence mm -hmm. um, needs to be put in, in consideration. If I came to you asking you about the mark of the beast, mm -hmm. that's a good cue. Let's start there. But if I was a completely new Christian, beginning me from the mark of the beast might be trying to climb the tree from the top. Mm. The analogy from growth is similar. Um, the tree grows fast as a seed, then as a seedling, and then it keeps from the leaves and keeps sprouting from there. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing. Unless there are certain fundamental truths, which until and unless they are embraced and accepted and understood, mm -hmm. um, Growing other things on top of that becomes an effort to try and plant um, someone's feet in midair. They, mm -hmm. they will not be able to stand. Mm -hmm. So unless somebody understands the tenets of the gospel, the 
reliability of scripture, the aspects of the character of God. Mm -hmm. When you now come to this more, should I call it sophisticated or exclusive, I don't know the right word, um, doctrines, mm -hmm. if you want to begin with that, it becomes very alienating because they have no roots um, upon which they are emanating. But if somebody has understood, for instance, scripture is reliable that mm -hmm. um, God has been acting in history and we are made in his image, it becomes easier to then layer on top. So what is true with building is true with feeding is true with agriculture and is also true with nurturing um, mm. souls in the world. Hey Amen. So as in the natural, so in the spiritual, that we start from, you know, what is easy for them to take and then we go to what they need to understand. You know, the, 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 there's a passage that talks about the, the Christ method, uh, alone seraphim, and in terms of that Jesus interacted with the people met their needs, and then bid them come follow me. And we're looking at lesson, uh, Tuesday's lesson that's talking about more Sabbath ministry. So after this incident at the synagogue where, you know, he, he, he cast out the demon, he then goes home with, with his friends, but they arrive in Peter's house. And tell us, what, what is it that we see in Peter's home, and how do we understand Christ's method in reaching his people? The book of Mark chapter 1, verse 29 says... And forth, forthwith, when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick of a fever, and anon they tell him of her. And he came and took her by the hand mm -hmm. and lifted her up, Amen. and immediately... The fever left her, and she ministered unto them. Let me pose it at that. You know, he is seen as a savior of ministry, mm -hmm. as a savior who, on his high on, and holy day, desires to do people good. Mm -hmm. He touches them that they may know him, and beyond that, then trust him, mm -hmm. and then he's able to win their confidence. Amen. And then when he tells them, come follow me, mm -hmm. they will come very fast. Amen. Because he has won their confidence. And look at this woman. She is healed. Mm -hmm. And immediately what does she begin to do? She to seems. minister mm -hmm. unto them. You know, I'm reminded of a quote in the book we were reading last quarter called Great Controversy, page 70, paragraph 2. It says, the spirit of Christ is a missionary spirit. Mm -hmm. The very first impulse of the renewed heart is to bring others also to the Savior. Mm -hmm. This woman, the moment she is touched, she begins to do ministry. Mm -hmm. How many of us, mm. once God has done something in our lives, he has healed us, and the greatest healing we can go through is the spiritual one. Mm -hmm. you, have been, you have received the gospel. Then what does it prompt you to do? Mm -hmm. Do you just sit down, are excited about it, and do nothing? Or are you prompted to do something for God. Mm -hmm. And then the word of God proceeds on and tells us, and at even when the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased mm -hmm. and them that were possessed with devils. Mm -hmm. And it was gathered together at the door. Which mm -hmm. door? Which yes. door must? Mm -hmm. At Peter's door. My friend, how many come to you because they have seen what is happening in, in you, life. in your life, in your experience. There are mm. many of us who outside there we go to work on the streets, wherever we may be, with our relatives who do not, are not of our persuasions, our friends, and they see nothing mm -hmm. that points them to Jesus. The Bible says in the book of Luke, if I be lifted up, mm. I will draw all men and to myself mm. are people seeing Jesus. People saw Jesus in that home. Mm. And what did they do? They flocked to him. You know, there are many of, many of us, people flock to us because of our degrees, mm. because of our money, mm. because of where we stay. You know, we stay in this very high-end uh, street. Mm. You know, because of who we know. Mm. For Peter, they saw Christ. And why first are people flocking into your life. And number two, why? Mm. And then to continue, we are told 
and he healed many that were sick of diverse diseases mm -hmm. and cast out many devils and suffered not the devils to speak because they knew him. Look, what is the Jesus in your life doing for people? Mm. Is the Jesus in your life doing for people? It is enough for people to know mm -hmm. Jesus is in your life. Amen. But what as a result is Jesus doing? And finally, verse 30 Five, allow me to get there. It says, mm -hmm. and in the morning, rising up a great while before day, mm -hmm. he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed, friends, I am just challenged to ask. You know, sometimes after a great ministry, you have preached, mm -hmm. you have, you have, you know, you have called an altar call and many people have flocked to the pulpit, mm -hmm. I mean, or you have taught children outside there and they left saying, teacher, we were blessed by this and that, teacher, we love you. What does it leave you mm -hmm. like? A question we need to ask ourselves, look, it is not the valley mm -hmm. that is least stable. It is the mountain top. Mm -hmm. I mean, many of us live, you know, it was a high day for Jesus in ministry. Mm -hmm. He was not stoned on that material day. Mm -hmm. He was not spat on. He was not slapped on this material. He was not cast out of the city because of his gospel. On this material day, many flocked to him. Mm -hmm. And you know, we are thinking maybe he would have been tired or maybe, you know, he would have, you know, relaxed. But look, he actually wakes up a great into the night he wakes up mm -hmm. when everybody's asleep and you know he still spends time with his god does th those high days i'm speaking to this minister out there those high days when you have preached mm -hmm. and you go back home do you still spend time with god thank you Amen. That is so profound. It is so profound. And I see in the lesson that there's a quote that says that not until the last sufferer had been re relieved did Jesus seize his work. Not until the last sufferer. I'm wondering, you know, and Raf, I'm, I'm looking to you because I'm, our church, is it possible? And, and as Seraphim has said, is it possible that maybe our Jesus is not visible or are we demonstrating this, Lord, that we are not able to see that there is so much suffering around us? What is missing in our church today that we cannot see the demonstration? And I'm not saying that the only answer of knowing that God is among us is miracles. But should we not be seeing these miracles, really? I think um, the, uh, part of it is going to be answered on the Wednesday, the secret of Jesus' ministry. But beyond that, I also think as a church, we need to focus more on the work, mm. I think, as opposed to talking about the work. You see, uh, Christ, when he was healing them and, mm. uh, and, and the demons wanted to speak and, and praise him, he told them, keep quiet. Mm. And, uh, and, and he, let, he let his work do the speaking for him. And we are told that whole evening, day after day, people were simply coming. Mm -hmm. People were simply coming. And whatever maladies, whatever issues that were there in, in society, at that particular point, Christ address them. And so then the question for us as, uh, as church members is we must ask ourselves, um, are, we, uh, are we addressing the issues mm. of, 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 of our society? Are we addressing the, the sufferings of, of the people in our, in our here and in our now? Mm. You know, sometimes we make plans and we fundraise, but we don't really, know, we don't really understand who is, to whom is this money going to, mm. you know? Uh, can we put a face? Can we say, I am fundraising for me to go and preach somewhere, you know, mm. and, 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 and be involved, be involved. And, and let's just talk about total member involvement, but let us be part, take part and parcel of the, of the work. When mm. we say, I am a Seventh-day Adventist, don't simply tell me about it, but let me see and know that indeed you are a Seventh-day Adventist. Not simply talking, but doing the deeds. Amen. Zef, Zef, I don't know if you have any thoughts on, you know, what, what does our Jesus look like in the church today? In your opinion, I, I think um, from just picking up from what Rafa said, you see, um, we we tend to hammer people with our Jesus. Mm. You know, we we just want to shoot at them and their doctrines, 
and 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 this actually came out just the other day mm. when um there was this demonstration and mm -hmm. guys were thinking that we are not out here to help and 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 there was a lot of uproar and part part of those memes that were doing round was that we just tell them about other people's doctrines which mm -hmm. are wrong what they didn't uh, the, what they don't need to do mm -hmm. and how we want them converted but but do they really see Jesus? You know, mm. Jesus is love, right? Mm. Jesus is love, and so if 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 I, if I have Jesus in me, then I should sh somebody should see love, mm. you know, like true love, which means I will take care of their needs. I will be listening. Mm -hmm. I will want to help where there is need. If someone is sick, I'll be very interested to first of all hear him out and see how I can help him before I, want, before I would want to convert him or before I preach the gospel to him. Mm -hmm. I should be more f interested in the maladies of the people mm -hmm. than converting them like Jesus was. You know, he would just heal them. You know, it's mm -hmm. like instant. You come, just heal, heal them before he would continue to preach, mm -hmm. which, which is, um, I think, if the church would do that, would be... Uh, Jesus will come back much sooner. Amen. Yeah. So we then are saying, uh, uh, the church, is that this gospel is a gospel of action. And love is a verb. Love is above. The gospel must be above. But there is a secret that Jesus knew, Sire. And we want to see what is this that Jesus understood that maybe we haven't really understood that gave him the power to be able to do the things that he was doing and the, how he was being able to do them. There's a saying that says, if somebody does something over and over, it means it, it's either one of two things. Mm -hmm. Either option one is this person is addicted um, mm -hmm. to this particular thing and it's having control over them. Or the person recognizes that that repeated action is so important, mm -hmm. hence they keep repeating it. Mm -hmm. Now, so for instance, um, uh, an athlete who keeps training every day um, cannot be necessarily accused of addiction to training, uh, but on the contrary, the athlete knows that they will play the way they practice. So they practice every day, they practice faithfully, they practice diligently and everything because um, they know the importance of practice. But somebody who keeps visiting the beer hall every day is probably medicating something on the basis of alcohol. Now, when that person is Jesus and we begin seeing an action being repeated, him being God incarnate and being perfect, option one does not really quite apply. He is not addicted or controlled uh, by certain things. If we therefore can eliminate option one, it means if we can see in Christ's life a repeated action, then we need to pay attention to it because he knew it was very important, hence he keeps repeating it. And the verse was already read, but I would like to repeat it again and would like to consider um, the book of Mark, chapter 1, when you read from verses 35 through to um, 39, speaking about um, Jesus. And, 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 and when you read this, we, we always need to remember this is happening on a day where in the morning um, he had um, spent um, Sabbath doing all manner of healing and stuff. In the evening, he's um, helped cure um, Peter's um, mother's, uh, Peter's, um, Peter's mother-in-law, basically. And then people have come and are now mobbing him and, you know, they want healing and stuff. So it's a, to say all of this, this is an intense day. Now, in the context of that intense days now, when you're reading verse 35. Now, in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those um, who are with him sought for him. When they found him, they said, um, they said to him, everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, let us go into the next town that I may preach there also. Because of this purpose, I have come forth. And he went, um, he went preaching in their synagogues um, throughout all Galilee and casting out demons. 
So interesting that in the, in the immediate context of everything we have just seen, you'd be expecting, if this was a modern day setting, would be expecting that if Jesus was vain, he would be on Instagram or on TikTok, you know, putting, you know, the picture saying like, yo, uh, just cast out another demon or hashtag um, healing, you know, or few exhausted. But that's not the kind of Jesus we see. We see a Jesus who leaves everything he has done and his popularity is soaring really high. Everyone is looking for him. But look for look at what he is looking for. He is looking for the face of his father. Mm. He is out there in the mountains. He's out there in a solitary place praying. And this is not a one-off thing. The idea of Jesus um, um, taking time out to pray is a constant theme in his life. When you read Matthew 4, verse 23, it says, And when he was, he sent forth the multitude away. He went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Um, now, when the evening came, he was all alone. That's, that's sorry, that's Matthew 14, not 4. That's Matthew 14. That's after... Um, he had fed a, a big crowd. Instead of sitting around to bask in the glory, he dismisses them, and then he goes to spend time in prayer. Mark would later on also document later in the life of Jesus in Mark 6, verse 46, and says, and when he had sent them away, he departed um, and went to the mountain to pray. In fact, even when you read on the very hours before he is arrested to eventually be crucified, the story is found in John 17, from verses 1 through to 26, Jesus is praying. So Jesus is at the, if there's an action he is seen to be repeating over and over and over, he is a man of prayer. He's a man of prayer. And you do notice he prays at different times. He prays at the end of a very successful ministry, what in a ministry lingua we call a mountaintop experience when he feels like he's at the top of the world. He prays when... Um, there's pressure around him, like in the case after feeding the 5,000, there was a lot of pressure to coronate him king and probably have him lead the people to take over from the Romans. So there's a lot of pressure to comply. But Jesus responds to that situation mm -hmm. with prayer. And he is praying when he is faced with perplexity and with imminent death and arrest in John 17. So Jesus is not just praying when it is good and great. Mm -hmm. Jesus is not just praying when... This pressure. This is not praying only when there is death. Jesus is praying at all times. Mm. And it is indicative of what the effect of the prayer is. So for instance, in, in the longer passage we've read in, in, in Mark, when the people come, when the disciples finally catch up with him in, in, in Mark 1, the story we've read from verses 35 to 39, and they're telling him, hey, there's a, there's a crowd. People are, you know, like you're the hottest um, thing in town. Jesus does not respond by, let me go back in there. He says, no. Mm. My purpose is to go and preach elsewhere. Mm. So it shows you what prayer is able to do because Christ had spent more time in prayer than listening either A, to the voices of the disciples or more to the voices of the crowd. He is able to have clarity of purpose even in a time when voices that would be pulling him away from the same were strong. Mm. Number two, what prayer does to Jesus is it helps him have the inner stealing, the inner fortification to be able to face hours and moments of trial like he did in John 17. And then three, Jesus is able to stay true to character, true to principle, and true to mission as a result of prayer. And then finally, the emphasis of Mark does not seem to be the timings of the prayer because you see him um, praying early in the morning. You see him um, staying late to pray. You see him praying into the night. So the, Jesus is praying at different times. Mm -hmm. So the focus does not seem to be length, duration. It seems to be the dependence that he had on prayer. Mm -hmm. So I know a lot has been made about, oh, you know, if you pray at three in the morning, that's the prayer God hears most. Or, oh, you know, you should pray at midnight. Mm -hmm. That's when it's most still. No, God is available at all times. What Christ was showing us is God is available in the evening. He's available in the night. He's available in the day. He's available over the noise um, of the crowd. He's available at all times. What he's looking for is for people to pray. Mm -hmm. And just to finish off on this, it's to remind us that prayer is opening of the soul to God as to a friend. It's putting 
our petitions to him as we would do to a friend. Prayer does not bring God to our level, mm. but what it does is that it brings us into the audience chamber of God mm. and allows us to have things and see them from a higher perspective. Prayer sensitizes the soul to the movements that God is making in life mm. and in our own life, and then allows us to therefore align with the direction that God is going. Prayer is not cake that we eat on special occasions. Mm. Prayer is food that we need to have at all times. And I agree with Ellen White. Prayer is the very breath of the soul. Amen. And it was a sick of Christ. Amen. Amen. How profound is that? I wonder how our prayer life is, my brothers and sisters, and how we realize that if the Savior, if God himself, recognize the importance of depending upon the Lord in prayer. How about us? Are we praying enough? My viewer, are you praying enough? The next question is, can you keep a secret then? And in this we see from, uh, from the book of, of, of Mark chapter 1, still we're in chapter 1, verse 40 to 45. And in this situation we see... Um, we see a leper, and, and as we know in the Old Testament, that leprosy was really dreaded. I mean, if you, every story that we've seen about the story of leprosy, anyone who, had, who was a leper, number one, they were outcast, they were cast out of the community, because, and it didn't matter who you are, we see, it, we see that in Naaman, we see that, you know, in the small and big people, that it would, you would be cast out of the community. But in this case, we see a Jesus who is able to relate with the marginal. You know, who are the marginalized in our communities? And we have a Jesus here who is able to relate with those who everyone shuns. And I want us to look, and, and, and I will pick you, Zeph, for example. To look at, uh, we, see, we see this leper, when this leper comes to Jesus, and maybe you can read for us so that then we know what we're looking at. And that's coming from Mark chapter 1 from 40 from to 40. 45. If you could please read for us. Okay. Um, uh, from verse 40. Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Mm -hmm. 41. Then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing be cleansed. 42. As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. And he strictly warned him and sent him away at once. And he said, unto him, and said to him, See that you, may, you say nothing to anyone, but go your way. Show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. However, he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city but was outside in deserted places and they came to him from every direction. Thank you, Zeph. I am looking at this story and seeing a leper who had faith. What do you see? What do you see in the faith of this leper in the question that he asks Jesus? I, I think um, this leper already had... 100% faith mm. that Jesus would actually sort him out. Mm. You know, I'm, I'm looking at him being an outcast, as you had said. You know, someone who is lonely, in despair, you know, is having like a disease. It's like when you have a disease that you're not sure, you, 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 you actually, you're not sure about life, you know that you're going to die. You know, like some of us, maybe we have some of these uh, diseases like cancer, and we are so hopeless, mm. you know. But, but when this person uh, saw Jesus, he, he saw hope, mm -hmm. you know. In, in Jesus, he saw that there was this power that mm. can get him out of this despair, mm. you know. And as you, had, you have also in, indi indicated, you know, in the past, um, uh, it was instruction for... for uh, for, for people with leprosy to stay away, mm -hmm. you know, you not even greet them. It was, it was, it was. If you greet them, you become unclean, mm -hmm. and 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 therefore, this is a person who no one is even greeting. Mm -hmm. Everyone is just walking past them, and they may be even running away mm -hmm. from you. And 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 with this, he saw that Jesus would actually sort him. And I don't know how he believed that actually Jesus would even touch him mm. and sort him out, even, even despite the fact that other people are also uh, running away from him. So I see a 100% faith mm. 
and trust in Jesus, which is a good lesson for us to also learn. Amen. And the question that he asks Jesus, Seraphim, is if you're willing. He knew that God was able. That wasn't the question. Is but was God willing? If you're willing. And what so speak to that, to if you're willing, and then speak to also to the action of the touching. Good. First, God is more willing to answer us our pleas mm. more than we are willing to ask. Amen. And I think this man was coming with an attitude of a contrition, but which still could as well appear like it is um, he was exonerating himself of the blessing which God had brought to him. Mm. And it is an attitude sometimes we go to God with. Mm. You know, you go to God with a wishy-washy attitude, mm. not so sure whether you know, you are not, it's not a matter of whether you doubt his ability. But because you don't want to be disappointed, you leave a room eh, mm. of, you know, like, let me not put all the eggs in one basket. You know, somebody said, great expectations make frustrated men. Mm. So you're like, let me dwindle my expectations mm. so that I'm not highly disappointed. Mm. But look, come boldly to Jesus. Amen. Come boldly to Jesus. Mm. And, and look, I love the faith of this man. Mm. One he believed that Christ could touch him. Amen. Leprosy was a very contagious disease. And on top of that, deadly. Mm. And on top of that, without cure. You know, mm. there are deadly diseases that have cure. Mm. This was a deadly disease that has no cure. Mm. But, you know, he believed Christ could touch him. Mm. And I want us to exercise that kind of faith. Mm. He is able to do exceedingly, mm -hmm. abundantly, mm. what we ask or think according to the power that mm. works in us. He is able to do above what uh, everybody mm. else can do. And then, I love especially that he believed in God's word. Amen. I, 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 there's a, a quote I love from a book written by one man called Wagner. Mm -hmm. uh, and he says, faith mm -hmm. is believing in God's word, taking that word and depending on it to do what it has said it will do. Amen. And you know, he said, be thou clean. Amen. And this man took that word, mm. depended on that word mm. to do what it has said it will do. Amen. And he was cleansed. I pray that God gives us that faith. Amen. Oh. Amen. Ralph, we're looking at, Mark is, look, is also looking at Jesus as the defender of what Moses had taught. So it's very important because he sends this leper and say, go show yourself to the priest. Why? Because Jesus could have said, I've healed you, go home. But he actually tells him, go show yourself to the priest. Why was this important? I think it speaks to Christ as one who obeyed the laws of the land. Mm -hmm. Having been part of uh, part and parcel of the people who sort of, uh, to a certain extent, uh, um, influenced uh, thinking and uh, tailoring of the law as led Mo Moses in the wilderness and the children of Israel. So in Leviticus chapter 14, there were those rites with which a leper was going to be allowed uh, or rather reintroduced back into society because leprosy in and of itself, I, th I, find, it, I find it interesting even, you see. You see, when uh, speaking about Christ healing, mm -hmm. uh, he speaks about the blind, they're sort of hip together. But in the midst of all these stories, there's this one story of a leper that is isolated mm -hmm. by, by Mark, showing us that... Um, it's, in essence, it was like the mother of all maladies. Mm. It was the mother of all diseases because not only were you isolated physically, but also um, in, in terms of being put away, but even people were not allowed, couldn't even allow themselves to touch you. Mm. That, but that, that's something, and to grow for maybe you didn't get leprosy in the beginning, so you knew human touch. Then at some point, then maybe for years, nobody has ever touched you, nobody has ever looked at you. Anytime you approach, people, people scatter. So there's a lot of stigma. So e leprosy in and of itself as a disease was, was, was quite something. And so there were rules in place for, uh, in order to reintroduce it to society. And one of them was that it, is, it was a prerequisite that you must present yourself to the high priest who will then do a medical examination thoroughly and then eventually now say for a fact that so-and-so uh, is now completely healed. And so 
I think uh, part of the reason also why Christ tells uh, the gentleman to keep quiet about it is so that he cannot prejudice the high priest mm -hmm. when the high priest is now uh, examining him, you know, so that he can, uh, he can actually get an unprejudiced examination, you know. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when, um, when people are playing games, etc., et sometimes you can say the referee is biased mm -hmm. against this particular team. In science, in research, we, we say you blind the researchers. Mm -hmm. And so, in essence, Christ was trying some sort of to blind this, uh, the, 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 the Pharisee. Mm -hmm. Because if this man kept quiet and said, simply examine me whether there's leprosy or not, without even questioning who exactly mm -hmm. healed me, then he gets a more objective, uh, a more objective, um, a more objective ass assessment. And so, it speaks to us of a, of, of a, of a God. I believe who not only follows the rules of the land to the latter as, um, and, um, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, ties himself to them and his actions to them, and also beyond that also opens his, uh, in essence, it, it tells us that the teachings of Christ uh, are incongruent with the teachings of the Bible. Amen. That anything that comes from God mm -hmm. must tally to the law and to the prophets, so to Amen. say. And so you cannot say that Christ has, is leading you today and you are in contravention to the things that Christ has said in the Bible. Mm, mm. So true, so true. Sire, this leper did not listen. <laughs> him, he was healed, and that's all that matters. And he walks around telling anyone who is willing to listen. And, and, and while that is, okay, I mean, that based on him and not understanding why the Lord had told him to, to, to keep quiet, I want us to speak to our church today and sometimes why. Why sometimes we need to be careful about about hampering the spread of the gospel in sometimes either by our words or actions even well intentioned so there's some things that we think we are doing and i'll give you an example which is social media i remember there's a time we had a problem in our church it was it, it became public knowledge when you know we had a few wrangles in the church and the loudest uh, the loudest noise and and criticism of church leadership came from church members now, while we tried to explain the reason why we shouldn't be the people doing that, there is a tendency for people to feel, but why are we covering up sin? Now, Sire, in your opinion, how is it that even well-intentioned, so we are saying if, if there's bad things that are happening in the church, then we need to expose them. But how we, what is the danger of some of these things that we may do that may hamper the gospel work in the end. So at that point in time, it may feel like you as a young person going on Twitter and saying, what is wrong with your church? You may have won a battle for that day, but we may lose the war in the end. Sire, si, I don't know what your thoughts are. I have two, I have two ways of looking at it, mm -hmm. so I'll explain both. One is, you, I, I usually tell people to subject the test for if you were not a member of this church and all you had to go by was its own presence online and the behavior um, of the members online, okay? So assuming you're not a Seventh-day Adventist and mm -hmm. you interacted with what the Seventh-day Adventist church puts online and what its members put online, you know, about their church, about themselves and everything. So the question is, would you become a member of the Seventh-day Adventist church? Mm -hmm. So before you put out any material, just always subject it to, to that particular test. Mm -hmm. And in most cases, the answer, like, um, I have met some, some of the roughest people I have met online um, are people who um, subscribe to Christian faith. Now, mm -hmm. I want to quickly and clearly say something here. If Sire is rough to people online, mm -hmm. that does not make the gospel untrue. Mm -hmm. Okay, that does not interfere with the truth or the not, um, or uh, or lack of truth about the Bible. Those are two separate things. But for most minds, they cannot separate the mm. two. They are like, if the gospel you teach makes you behave like this, then the gospel you believe must be untrue. Mm. So that's test number one. But then test number two is now more an internal test. Mm. If the um, if the church. Um, and by church, I mean the structures, the organization, the leadership, does not create either A, the sense that they are open to and able to listen, mm -hmm. B, the, um, that there is a feeling that there is a clear process of how I'll be listened to and that these, it can be my views can be adjudicated and something will be done by them. Mm -hmm. In a digital world, 
people will want to be heard and they will move elsewhere. Mm. So it's going to be, so the eventual solution is going to be members sitting back and through the aid and the grace of the Holy Spirit ask themselves, is what I'm putting out truthful? Is it useful? Mm. Is it relevant? Is it honest? You know, mm. subject to whatever you're about to put out to the Philippians test, whatever is true, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, if it's of a good report, yeah, then if it meets our test, put it out. That's a mm. that's an individual test. But then internally it speaks to the need for the church to build systems that are quicker, more agile, more responsive, mm. where people feel that they can be hard and that when they are hard, um, it is applied. Mm. Otherwise, if there's a failure on any of those two arms, they'll end up being a net imbalance of what is being put out in the world. And yes, individuals will win a battle, but we will win the eventual war of influencing the society with the truth of the gospel. And make no mistake, the gospel is true. Amen. Amen. As we come to the end, I want us to think about our closing remarks, but we also must be careful. There are some situations actually, which even you put missionaries, you know, there are missionaries who are in fields that are actually dangerous for them to be Christians. And sometimes there may things that we may do well intentioned, but could actually cause the loss of life of our missionaries. So let's be wise. And the Lord is not a God of confusion. God is able to give us wisdom. My brothers and sister, your last one minute each, your last comment. Let's start with you, Raf. Um, um, it's an interesting um, a story, especially one for the, for the leper. It speaks about one who has noted Christ is healing people, mm. and he says, you have the power to heal me. And beyond mm. that, Christ goes and does what that which perhaps had not been done to him. He touches him mm. and cleanses him. Amen. Whereas touching a leper would make you unclean, if Christ touches you, then it's not your filth. Mm. It's his righteousness. Amen. His touch makes us clean. Amen. I think that's, that's it for me. Amen. Seraphim. I pray that we learn from Christ. And what we are learning from Christ is that his works and not his words mm. spoke more. Amen. And I'm prone to borrow from one man in the past who said, Preach, if necessary, use words. Amen. Zeth. Speaking from what Seraphina said, mm -hmm. you know, action, action and action. Action actually mm -hmm. speaks louder than words, mm -hmm. is a cliche. Um, borrowing from the words of the hymn, rescue the perishing, care for the dying, mm -hmm. snatch them in mm -hmm. pity from sin and the grave, weep o'er oh, the erring one, lift up the fallen. Tell them of Jesus, the mighty to save. Amen. I see that playing out in the book of Mark. Tell them of Jesus, the mighty to save. Mm. Rescue the perishing. Amen. Sire. The, what I learned from the life of, a, a life in the day of Jesus is that what is needed in this day and time is a gospel mm -hmm. that is hard. I mean, that is, that is sin mm -hmm. and not just hard. That is understood and not just preached Amen. and is felt mm. and not just merely hard, understood or seen. Mm. Until we are able to transcend those three layers, then the gospel we have will become important. Amen. Amen. Our dear viewers, this morning there's a question that the lesson is asking at the end there. How did Jesus maintain a calm and steady approach to ministry and people in spite of his very, very busy schedule. It is undoubtedly because of his daily experience in prayer. If the Savior saw the need to pray, how about you? How about me that I should depend on the Lord because I know just how weak I am without prayer? Thank you so much for joining us this Sabbath morning. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord bless your families. Until we see you again next week. And next week we will be looking at the controversies. <laughs> Let us see what controversies we're talking about in the book of, of Mark. We've been studying the book of the great controversy. Let us see. We shall see next week what controversies we're talking about. And until we meet you again next week, shall we pray to close our lesson? Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this powerful, powerful lesson, teaching us from your word 
that there is so much that there is to do. And your people are desperately in need of a savior. Oh, how I pray that our religion will be a religion of action. The people will see Jesus in us and desire to know him and to walk in him. May you be alive in us, O Lord. May you be alive in me, in my brothers and sisters, that those who see us would see you and desire to know you. This is our humble prayer, even until we meet again next Sabbath, in Jesus' name. Amen Amen. and amen.